Thank you for joining us this evening for the Bankruptcy and Debt Relief Webinar, presented by Goodman & Associates. Tonight, you'll learn that overwhelming debt is not the end of the world, and there are ways to get control of it so it doesn't rule your life. Ed Goodman is one of Southeast Michigan's leading experts on bankruptcy law and debt relief strategies. His firm, Goodman Associates, has also been a longtime advertising partner with 103.5 FM WMUZ, currently on The Bob Duco Show and The Chris Ayotte Show. He and his staff have a lot of information to share that you're going to find helpful. In case you missed it or want to review any part of tonight's webinar, we are recording it and we'll have it posted to wbc.com slash bankruptcy within 24 hours. Remember, Goodman Associates will get you through this. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here's Ed Goodman. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar on bankruptcy law and debt consolidation. Um, I wanted to introduce the rest of my staff, who's also with me, uh, the bankruptcy side of our firm, uh, Brian Ruckert, Kim Fund, and Catherine Shen. And they're here to answer your questions, if you have any. Uh, probably the best way to get us questions, uh, and you can send them anytime during this seminar, is to use the chat feature in the lower part of your screen. If you just uh, move your mouse down there, it'll pop up as chat, and they'll be monitored here and we'll answer your questions as we go. So with, uh, without further ado, what we're gonna do is to go to screen sharing, I hope. Okay, we have uh, prepared some slides and stuff for everybody to consider, but just as we go through this, I'm not gonna read all the material on these slides to you. Uh, if anybody's interested in getting a copy of these slides, we'll be glad to send them to you. The purpose of this is not just to read you something. So we're gonna to touch upon some of the subjects that are mentioned in the slides. And uh, again, if you have questions about anything that comes to mind, use the chat feature, send us these questions. Uh, my associate Tim will let me know what the questions are and we'll try to answer them for you. So in today's environment, uh, if you're watching this probably, you've been impacted by COVID-19 one way or the other. And many people have been impacted more deeply than others. Uh, they've lost their jobs. Uh, they haven't been able to pay their mortgages. Um, they're uh, facing a time when the federal subsidy of that $600 a week under the CARES Act runs out. In fact, it runs out tomorrow. And then after this month, uh, 90 days worth of mortgage payments plus the current mortgage payment are due unless Congress extends some kind of relief for mortgage payments. So a lot of people are facing some substantial difficulties. Besides the fact that millions and millions of jobs around the country and certainly thousands in this area have been eliminated. So these are things that might cause you to consider debt consolidation, debt settlement, perhaps bankruptcy. Unique thing about bankruptcy is uh, in, in a couple of its forms, it can prevent foreclosure, prevent repossession of cars and allow you to pay your bills over as many as 60 months. Uh, in one instance, we can actually file for much longer plans than that, but that involves a chapter 11 and we'll touch upon that too. So let's, let's get started here. There, there's a lot of different myths about bankruptcy. This is really not much of uh, one anymore. You can't file for bankruptcy anymore. This was the thought that, uh, that was spread around during the, uh, administration in 2005, and uh, it wasn't true at all. It's just that the bankruptcy code changed in 2005, and it, it made bankruptcy different than it had been prior to October 17, 2005. So, but bankruptcy is still available. Bankruptcy comes from a dictate, a mandate in the Constitution that directs Congress to pass laws dealing with bankruptcy. So we're always going to have bankruptcy laws if Congress abides by the Constitution, which I hope they do. And uh, it, it's set up to help people who get into situations where they can't otherwise get themselves out. And it's a, it can be a, a great assistance. Uh, if uh, you file for bankruptcy, the likelihood of anybody knowing that you file for bankruptcy is very slim. There are lists of bankruptcy published in certain instances, but they go into uh, just a few publications, although bankruptcy information is a public record. But it, it, the, basically, it's like World War II. Loose lips sink ships. If you don't want people to know that you filed bankruptcy, don't tell them, and then nobody will know. 
Um, you can, you're not going to lose any property in most instances. Uh, it's very rare that people give up property, except in situations where there's a lot of equity in certain properties and um, in business situations as well. But it's very rare that any of our clients that give up any property in bankruptcy. You can, you can always uh, acquire property afterwards. There's no prohibition against buying things. There's no prohibition about getting credit again. You, there's actually, um, if you file, for instance, a Chapter 7, and as I said earlier, we're going to go over those things as to what they mean. But if you file a Chapter 7, you can have a, a great credit score in three years and maybe even less, depending on how you conduct yourself and how you approach your, your financial situation. Uh, but it's very easy to rebuild your credit score after a bankruptcy. And right now, uh, the FHA rules are such that you have to be three years out of bankruptcy and have a 650 credit score, which is only a good credit score. It's not an excellent credit score or anything like that. To get a mortgage, to buy a home. So th there's a recovery period. And certainly, uh, there, it is a, uh, an obstacle to doing certain things. But uh, three years goes by very quickly. And it's possible to have a 720 credit score, which is an excellent credit score. If you have, if you monitor your, uh, your credit scores and what I tell people to do is use credit Sesame or credit karma. These are really good services or online or for free. And they'll give you your credit reports, your credit scores, anytime you want them without expense. So, uh, both people don't have to file if that's, uh, if it's not appropriate, we make a determination as to what's appropriate for you and help you make that decision when you come into our office. Uh, it's not hard to file for bankruptcy. There are things that you have to do. There are some prerequisites that uh, are required by both the bankruptcy court and court and also the things that the trustees want to have us do. And by the way, the trustees are an individual that's appointed by the government to represent your creditors. And so that's where bankruptcy gets its efficiency. Instead of dealing with 20 different attorneys, if you had 20 different creditors, uh, you probably end up with a trustee and maybe one or two attorneys, depending on how much secured debt you have. But the trustee represents the unsecured creditors for the most part. And these cases move along with some speed. It's not something you're gonna be wrapped up in the court part of these processes for a, a couple of years or anything like that. It'd be very unusual. Um, there are some other things in here. Uh, miss, well, it doesn't really get rid of debt. Uh, sooner or later, you start to pay it back. No, that's not true. In a Chapter 7, you get a complete discharge of your dischargeable debts. They're gone forever. In a Chapter 13, you pay per the plan, and the portion of the uh, debt that is not paid per the plan is discharged, assuming you complete the plan that has you pay a portion of your debts, and in some cases, none. Um, uh, a lot of the cases that we file here are what we call zero dividend cases, and they provide no payout to the unsecured creditors whatsoever, and they still work. Uh, many people who cannot file a Chapter 7 can file a Chapter 13, and when I say they cannot file, it's because their, their income's too large or their equity is too great, things of that nature that would prevent them from filing a Chapter 7, but they can still get the same result. It's just that they have to pay the penance of being in, involved with the chapter 13 for three to five years, and then they get a discharge of their debts and they're gone forever. So nobody can come back to you over a discharge debt. A discharge is a federal court order saying that you no longer have the responsibility or liability to pay back your debts. Okay. Um, it won't hurt your credit for 10 years. It does stay on your credit report for as many as seven or 10 years, depending on what we're talking about. But uh, as I said, after three years, you can have a 720 credit score higher, even in some cases, and you'll be able to get credit and buy cars at good interest rates and things like that. If you pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and then uh, your creditors cannot harass you after that. And what goes into place when you file a bankruptcy is what we call the automatic stay. The automatic stay for your purposes is, is um, like an injunction that prevents people from contacting you. They can't call you, write you, whatever. They have to deal with your attorneys. And uh, until this stay is lifted for one, the case is over with, or 
you've got uh, a discharge, nobody can call you, uh, not legally anyway. And there, aren't, there is recourse for those people who break the rules or against those people that break the rules. Okay, uh, now, one of the things that I often get a question about is people say, well, I wanna put this debt into bankruptcy, but not the one I owe to my uncle Joe or whatever it happens to be. That's not how bankruptcy works. It's all or nothing. Around here, I, I call this rule the prime directive because I'm a Star Trek fan. But the prime directive here is you list all your income, all your assets, all your debt. You can't pick and choose what goes through. We apply the rules and typically you end up with a very favorable result but you have to include all your debt. You can't pick and choose what goes through a bankruptcy. And then uh, finally, can you afford to file a bankruptcy? In most instances, you're talking to a bankruptcy attorney because you can't afford not to file a bankruptcy, but it's not that expensive. We'll talk about fees later on in this seminar uh, and we'll go over those type of things. Now, people say, oh, I don't wanna file bankruptcy and they really don't know what bankruptcy is. Bankruptcy by itself has taken on the connotation and it has a, a negative stigma, but it, it really should. It, it's a, a federal set of laws that are available to you. As I said earlier, they're, uh, they're, they're based on a, a, con, a constitutional mandate to Congress to pass laws. These are your rights to file a bankruptcy. Uh, the Supreme Court has not said that the right to file bankruptcy is akin to a civil rights, but they have said that as long as you're telling the truth and you do what the code requires, you will have the right to file a bankruptcy. So everybody has the right to do it. Some people choose not to, some people have a moral religious reason not to, but in, you know, the bankruptcy laws are in very much part based on biblical sections. Um, for those of you who are more obviously more knowledgeable about the Bible than I am. Uh, there's a concept in the Bible called Jubilee, which was a relief of debt every six years. Um, well, it used to be six years for chapter seven, but now you can only file once every eight years. But in any event, it's you know, bankruptcy and debt relief is biblical. It's part of our Judeo-Christian ethics. And it sometimes you just need to avail yourselves of the laws that are available to help you. And so we can help you decide whether or not you want to do that. Okay. Now, most debt is dischargeable through bankruptcy, uh, medical debt, car loans, mortgages. Um, you, you can keep your home, even if you file against your mortgage, because you just keep paying it. You can assume that debt. The lien stays on your house, but you don't necessarily have to pay that note if per, perhaps you uh, befall into other financial difficulties, you can literally walk away after your house is discharged because you don't have any liability on it if you haven't reassumed your mortgage debt. Um, you can get your buy yourself time to catch up on rent and utility payments and certain types of taxes as well. Those things that are not dischargeable are intentional torts like fraud and theft or conversion, things of that nature. Uh, things that are based in negligence. Uh, for instance, we get people through here who have had car accidents and for whatever reasons haven't had insurance. Well, that debt is caused by their negligence very often or their vicarious liability under state law. Um, and we're able to get rid of that. The things you do that are illegal typically are not gonna be dischargeable. Student loans by statute are not dischargeable under the 2005 bankruptcy code. Although there are instances where that is, we can work that out too. And we can also find ways of abating the payment of your liability during a chapter 13, for instance. And then domestic relation and spousal support orders are not dischargeable as well. Okay, we talked about the automatic stay and this is it says, or it said it remains in effect. Creditors cannot continue lawsuits, make wage garnishments, or even make telephone calls demanding payment. And sometimes people file bankruptcy to get the automatic stay to prevent tax levies. And that's not an uncommon type of thing. If you are you can't otherwise get things settled with the IRS, very often a bankruptcy will be a good solution for you because it will give you a, a time to either pay it, uh, your debt over five years. It's enforceable against the IRS. It, it, you start start taking control, not the governmental entity that's trying to 
uh, close you down or take your livelihood away from you. Bankruptcy can protect you from them as well. And then, as it says here, there are certain things that the automatic stay won't get involved with. Criminal matters, for instance, collection of child support, taxes, and family court matters. Uh, many years ago, I had somebody come through here who had uh, been in Las Vegas who uh, had given a bad marker for $203,000 to the court, to the uh, casino. And I, he was being pursued by the Clark County, Nevada Sheriff. And uh, they had him arrested and put into a, uh, a jail in Oakland County waiting extradition. So, you know, I could not stop that. As it turns out, his family was able to come up with the money. He was very, very fortunate. And they released him, and that was the end of it. Uh, I did have a, a, a discussion with the Clark County Sheriff uh, about that. And the same thing would go, by the way, for the casinos in downtown Detroit. But the Clark County Sheriff said, well, Ed, I'm probably the biggest collector in the world. I run a big collection agency here. And he uh, was expert at going after these people. And bankruptcy would not stop it. So don't give bad markers to the casinos. And... Uh, don't think that you can get out from under it through bankruptcy if you do. So there are some different types of bankruptcy. Um, we've referenced chapter seven and 13 and a little bit of chapter 11. Let's go through them with a little more detail. Um, we've got chapter seven and that is sometimes called a liquidation and that's a bad name for it. But uh, basically what a chapter seven does is you list all your income, your assets, your debt, assuming that you don't have any of those non-dischargeable things. You file a petition for relief from the court. Uh, the automatic stay goes into place. And uh, the, uh, I gotta get my power back up here. There we go. Um, and you go downtown once for a hearing called a 341 hearing, which is a hearing that has to be conducted by the trustee assigned to your case. Nowadays, under COVID, these things are being conducted from home by phone. So you don't even have to go to court. Uh, it's very rare in a Chapter 7 that anybody actually appears before a judge. You have the Chapter 7, the trustee uh, or the trustee's attorneys conduct these hearings. They ask you a few questions about what's going on and whether or not the petition that you filed was true. And uh, assuming that it was and there are no other issues in uh Typically from 10 to 20 weeks later, you get an order of discharge issued to you uh, effective as of the date that you filed your petition. So you can eliminate credit card debt, personal debt, payday loans, uh, merchant cash advances if you're personally liable on them, medical debts, uh, older tax debts as provided you've uh, filed your returns on time for the most part. And uh, there's all sorts of other types of relief from Chapter 7 as well. Now, chapter 13 is what a lot of people need to, if they need to save their home or their car. If you get behind on these things and you're facing repossession, and typically repossession will start on a car after two, two months of being delinquent or in arrears. And if you haven't made some other kind of arrangement with the creditor to catch up. So they might take your car. But if you file a chapter 13, they cannot take your car because there's a plan in there on how to pay that debt. Typically, the creditors want you to catch up in two, three months. And Chapter 13 says, no, you don't have to do that. You can do that over three to 36 months, depending on your circumstances. So 36 to 60 months. Um, so that's, uh, that's very helpful. Now, with regard to mortgages, um, a lot of people, as I alluded to earlier, are probably going to be facing some kind of foreclosure situation very soon because they haven't been paying their federal back mortgage on time, or they just haven't been paying their mortgage on time. Under most rules, if you haven't paid your mortgage for 90 days, the creditor is required to start a foreclosure. A lot of people say, well, why do they have to foreclose me? I could make amends and I could catch up and so forth. And what they're forgetting are a couple different things. One, mortgages are often sold into the marketplace. And when they're sold, there's conditions, we call them covenants, of that sale. And the covenants are that the person who created the, the loan and who's selling it into the, into the securitized marketplace 
is required to start a foreclosure if the uh, loan appears to be bad. And then there's also a provision in the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation that says if a loan becomes suspect that the FDIC member, the bank or whoever again issued that loan must begin a foreclosure. So it's not like they want to. And you, this issue is not really very well explained to people when they do file. But for the most part, they have to. And, you know, that puts you in a situation, if you haven't paid your mortgage, of losing your home. And Chapter 13 will stop it. And it will give you a payment plan to catch up and get your mortgage right, keep your home and your equity in your home, and to move on from there. So as it says here, just like seven, Chapter 13 will prevent you from predator harassment. It will protect you from the foreclosures and auto repossession we talked about. It will eliminate credit card penalties and fees and wage garnishments, and it will stop utility shutoffs as well. But you do sometimes have to pay a deposit or have a plan on catching up on your utilities a little bit faster than you would in other circumstances. Now, we talked about Chapter 11 very briefly. <clears throat> Chapter 11 is a, a section of the bankruptcy code that deals with reorganizations. Typically, businesses avail themselves for that. When you hear of J. Crew and J. C. Penney and uh, other large companies seeking protection under the bankruptcy code, they file under Chapter 11. It doesn't mean they're going out of business. It means they're reorganizing themselves, and they have a lot of time to figure out a plan on how to do that. Um, the, those of us who are local here to Detroit are certainly familiar with the Detroit bankruptcy. They, they are in a chapter nine, which they had a plan of adjustment, but it was the same type of thing, only it had slightly different rules available to it, but a plan has to be put together and it's negotiated out with the creditors. Sometimes we can eliminate a lot of debt. Other times we don't want to eliminate debt because the, the individuals finally chapter 11 have personal liability on these debts. And it would just mean that the creditors would come after them. And so sometimes we plan to file bankruptcy uh, plans that provide 100% payment to the creditors in order to prevent them from suing the individuals. So Chapter 11 is available to individuals. Sometimes we use it when uh, instances where there's a lot of student loan debt because Chapter 11 is not restricted to uh, a 60-month payment plan. We've done 10-year payment plans, 15-year payment plans, and even 20-year payment plans for our clients and they've been approved by the court or what we call confirmed and people can get their lives back. Uh, recently, we're working on one where the student loan debt is around $640,000. And so that's a 15 year payment plan that we put together. And it looks like it's going to be confirmed after we make some adjustments to the plan and uh, file what we call the order confirming the plan that makes that adjustment. And then our clients will be in a situation where they can work themselves out of those huge amount of student loans. Uh, so anyway, Chapter 11 is available to individuals, proprietorship companies, which are in effect individuals as well, corporations, small business owners, limited liability companies, and partnerships. There's a new um, section of Chapter 11 called Subchapter 5 that's also available, but uh, we as a firm believe it has limited utility, but it, it may be appropriate for your business. So the idea is if you have business financial issues and you're considering seeking protection under the court, come in and meet with us. We don't charge for uh, first meetings uh, unless you retain us. So you're, there's, you're not at risk for any legal fees or anything like that to come in and get answers to your questions. And we hope that you do that. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> chapter 12 is to help people who have farming issues. And it is incredibly uh, useful uh, chapter for people involved with the farming. Their main income has to be uh, uh, derived from uh, farming or fishing and uh, uh, from a commercial end. And, uh, so, and you can't have debt exceeding $4.1 million or nearly $2 million for, for fishermen. But there, you can have very flexible plans. 
in a chapter 12, there is a trustee involved, but um, in the state of Michigan, there are some very fine trustees who know how this works. And uh, this can be a, a huge amount of help to people who are suffering from the, uh, the China trade issues from COVID-19 or just the, the general market in, in the United States for, for food and dairy in particular. So uh, that can be of help to you as well. Now, uh, we've alluded to different types of alternatives to bankruptcy. Uh, just today, I had a couple in uh, at four o'clock today. Uh, they have lost a great deal of their income due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, they own a home free and clear, has $250,000 of equity. And uh, they have about $50,000 worth of debt they can't pay. On the other hand, uh, they're reticent uh, and reluctant to take out a mortgage on their house because their, their concern is, well, what about the second surge of Corona-19 or COVID-19? And what do we do then if we can't make even a small payment from the mortgage? So chapter 13 is the answer for them. It would require them to pay that $50,000, 100% of it, because they have so much, excuse me, they have so much equity in their home. The rules of chapter 13 in a very general sense are as follows. You pay to your unsecured creditors the amount you can afford to pay after allowance for a reasonable budget from your income. That might be zero, in which case we file it for zero. But that rule is modified by the following rule in bankruptcy. And that is, is that you must pay your unsecured creditors the same thing they would get in a chapter seven. Well, if you have $250,000 of equity in a home, after, a, a, after the exemptions that are available, you might have as much as $200,000 of unprotected equity. In other words, you'd have to pay the whole $50,000 back. But you pay it back over five years, 60 months, and it may be without interest. And in some cases it would be, and others it wouldn't. You'd have to pay nowadays a trustee fee of about 10% of what you pay in, but it's still going to be significantly lower than the 24.99% or 35%. The one case, these people had a 39.99% uh, credit card interest rate. Obviously, that's impossible to deal with. I mean, even taking a minimum payment, you're going backwards when you have that kind of interest rate. Chapter 13 can help them a lot and give them the protection of knowing that, you know, as long as they have some income and can make these planned payments, they'll be okay and they won't lose their home. So um, debt management programs. There are a few debt management programs around here. Um, the only one that I can actually recommend to people is Green Path. Uh, they would take your debt and uh, take it down through the means that they have of dealing with this as a, a company that's involved with it and a legitimate company. And we take your interest rates down from 24.99 or 39.99, whatever it happens to be, they're probably nowadays five to 7.5%. So, but it would be a five year payout and you'd end up paying 100% of your debt but at a much lower interest rate. A debt consolidation loan is fine if you can, if you have the credit with which to do it. Most people who are uh, considering or contemplating bankruptcy don't have the credit with which to get a debt consolidation loan. Debt consolidation loans where you take that whole $50,000 you pay it off with another loan and then you pay that $50,000 loan. Well, they could do it if they got a debt consolidation loan that was secured by a mortgage, but in the instance of this uh, example that I gave you, they didn't want to do that either. And then there's debt settlement. And, and debt settlement means paying less than 100 cents on the dollar for each amount of debt that you have. But typically the best debt settlements can be had if you have cash. So let's say you had $50,000 debt to return to the example that we talked about a moment ago, and um, you hired a, a law firm to settle these debts. Typically, we're able to settle things for between 25 and 50% dollar on the dollar, but certain companies won't do it. And if, if uh, they ask for financial information on our clients in order to negotiate a deal, we have to give them accurate information and in the instance of these people with a $50,000 debt, they have $250,000 unpaid equity in their home. 
the creditors are typically not going to agree to a discounted amount when you have that kind of equity. So uh, what do you do if you can't do that? Well, if you have a mortgage, you can perhaps re refinance your mortgage and get some money out of it. You might be able to get a second mortgage and, and pay off a, the, the debt. Um, the debt negotiating or litigation here, that means you're being sued and you want to avoid that if you can. Uh, typically, when you run up credit card debt and you've used the, the card properly and you, know, you, you used it legally, you're liable. And if you get sued, they will get a judgment against you. Judgments in the state of Michigan are for 10 years and they're going to be re renewed 10 years forever. So they, they, judgments don't go away. They also mess up your credit quite a bit. So the thing is, is to avoid litigation uh, at all costs. And if the avoid, avoiding litigation means filing a Chapter 13, Chapter 13 is actually, in most instances, the better alternative. Um, you can negotiate a lower interest rate in some cases. Um, a lot of credit card companies are, are just absolutely adamantly against that, though. Uh, Amex won't do it. Discover doesn't do it. I think Citicorp is also a, one of the more uh, difficult ones to deal with. The other Visa and MasterCard issuers are a little bit easier to get along with. Uh, sometimes you can negotiate a repayment plan for the whole thing. But again, if you can't do it for all of them, then it becomes difficult to balance it out. Again, Chapter 13 would do it for all of them because that's exactly how it works. You can refinance or sell your home idea in most instances is to keep your home. So why would you want to do that? I mean, it would pay off your debt and give you some money, but you still have to have a place to live. And you'd have to put some money into another uh, home. And then there's reverse mortgages. And a lot of people have heard all sorts of horror stories about reverse mortgages, but that was before they were, they were uh, taken over by FHA. Reverse mortgages are now a very highly regulated program. And in some instances, they're the best thing you can do. Because if you have a lot of equity in your home, you can draw it out with a reverse mortgage that eliminates your mortgage payments, but for taxes and insurance, which still have to be maintained by you. And you might be able to draw enough out of it to pay off your debt and have your home without a mortgage payment. Now what happens is that the mortgage continues to accrue interest at whatever the agreed upon interest rate is within that mortgage. And so your equity is being eaten up as you, as you go, but um, you can still refinance out of that reverse mortgage at another time. And if uh, you're, you pass during the time that you have a reverse mortgage, your family has 90 days with which to negotiate a purchase of the house and pay off the reverse mortgage and still keep your property and the equity that might be in there as well. So reverse mortgages can be a very useful tool outside of bankruptcy, okay? Now, uh, these, this is the timeline that deals with some of the bankruptcy issues. First of all, you have to be a resident of the state of Michigan for 180 days. Uh, that's jurisdictional. We, we, if you want to file a bankruptcy and you haven't become a resident of the state of Michigan for 180 days, you actually have to go back to your other jurisdiction. So we have one client now who is trying to get himself qualified as a Michigan resident but he's lived in Florida up until about 90 days ago. So he has another 90 days to go before he could file a bankruptcy in one of our courts up here. Um, 90 days before filing, if you pay your creditors, um, you're more than likely creating what we call a preference. Or if you pay money owed to a partner or uh, a relative, or what we call insiders within a year, that's called an insider transaction. Those, those transactions are reversible. So you don't want to do that if you're contemplating bankruptcy. You don't want to start paying you know, somebody uh, like an uncle, Joe, to return to him again uh, you know, in, in lieu of paying another creditor because the trustee in bankruptcy has a right to go back and, and get that money from your creditors uh, after they've been paid. Okay? Before bankruptcy, you have to file a, a, a credit counseling certificate this is something in our office we set people up with, but you can do it outside of our office if you wish, or with other attorneys, they probably have the same system of setting people up for this. These are requirements of the bankruptcy code. So you, you have to, it's usually done online. 
you can do it over the phone. Uh, it's timed, so you're on there for about an hour. And they try to give you uh, information that will hopefully, uh, one, qualify you as somebody who can file a bankruptcy. Most people are certainly qualifiable. And uh, it's a requirement that we have to have done before we can actually file the petition. Sometimes people come in here and they need to file it the next day. So they, we send them home with a list of homework to do. And one thing is getting this pre-filing credit counseling done. The way we have it done, we get a certificate the next day and we're, we're, uh, uh, have the ability to file for them the next day and get that automatic stay in place, uh, stop all the calls, and things like that. So um, it's important that that be done. Then we, uh, when we file, uh, the automatic stay goes into place and notice is given to all the creditors by the bankruptcy court. That's why it's so important that you list 100% of your creditors when you file. It's very, very important in order to get that automatic stay in place. And then within five weeks, give or take a day or two from the date of filing, you have a creditor's meeting, which I refer to as a 341. It's typically the only time you have to go down to court, but there are other times. I don't mean that it's exclusive to the 341, but in most cases nowadays, that's the only time you have to go to court. Uh, more than once. And it's not before a judge. And again, it's very unusual for our clients to have to appear before a judge. They have to appear for this hearing at a 341, which is not a, a totally formal hearing, but it is recorded. You're sworn in, you're under oath, you've got to tell the truth. And in fact, bankruptcy exists because people are required to tell the truth and you should tell the truth. If you misrepresent yourself in your petition or the facts about your case, it's a felony. It's perjury. Don't do that. <laughs> you actually have to sign a petition four or five times in various places saying that you're telling the truth. And then when you go down to the 341 hearing, you're asked again, did you tell the truth? So don't get, don't get caught not telling the truth. It uh, has very onerous consequences. Okay. So uh, after you file, we have to file a statement of intention as to what you're going to do with your contracts. If you're want to keep your car, if you want to keep in your home, if you want to assume a mortgage or uh, uh, adopt a lease and retain uh, a lease going forward so that you can keep the property that you have. And also after filing, you have to do what we call a, a debtor's uh, a, a credit counseling. Uh, and that's a two hour online class. And that certificate must be done before you can get a discharge from the court. Again, sometimes people we warn them to do it, but if you don't do it, you're held up and you're kind of wasting your time and your money because then you have to spend more money to reopen your case, get permission to file that uh, creditor's uh, and debtor's uh, uh, education certificate. And uh, it can be a real problem if you don't have it and it'll cost you money. So the best thing to do is just do it because if you come through our office, you will have already paid for it and you're good to go. Okay. So this says about 10 weeks after filing. Sometimes the trustees candidly take more than that, 15, 20 weeks. But it does happen, assuming that there aren't any uh, you know, issues with your case and you've told the truth and the trustee has determined that you do or do not have the assets that you have and whether or not uh, they can get anything. Their job, by the way, is to see if they can find any unprotected assets that you have and give them to the creditors. And they have the power to sue you to get those those assets or to make you turn them over to him or her. Um, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that doesn't happen. So you shouldn't be fearful about somebody coming out to your house, somebody doing inventory, somebody actually taking property out of your house. It, it doesn't happen. And unless they find that you misrepresented yourself. Okay. So uh, we've talked about... Uh, bankruptcy preventing repossession. Uh, it, in, in a chapter seven, we don't have the power to get your vehicle back once it's repossessed. In a chapter 13, we can actually force a, the creditor to give back a repossessed vehicle. So if you're facing that kind of situation, you should definitely talk to us, okay? Okay, now the impact of COVID-19. The CARES Act, has um, given people that 90-day forbearance of government-guaranteed loans. 
those are FHA backed loans and Fannie Mae backed loans and um, Freddie Mac loans. And as I said earlier, after 90 days, all the arrearages are due under the way the statute is written. So you could be facing a four month backlog in August 1st. So it can have a severe impact on people who have been out of work, whether you've gotten that $600 a week supplement or not. And after this month, assuming again, the Congress hasn't provided any alternatives, there's not gonna be the money to pay these things. But understand this, there is a means of protecting your home and that's chapter 13. Governor Whitmer's ban on evictions is uh, running out. And uh, if you've been leasing, you, you have to make amends with your landlord or you have to file a chapter 13 so that you can stay in your property. Uh, if you plan on leaving, then perhaps a chapter seven would do it. The CARES Act unemployment, we talked about that. That's that $600 a week unemployment uh, supplement that is provided to the states and you're getting that along with your checks. Uh, after tomorrow, the 20, or excuse me, after the 25th, that is no longer the law. Those monies will not be coming to you. So it's important that you do something about that. Student loan relief, we can't get a discharge of most student loans. Uh, some student loans are uh, available for people who have become disabled and we can get them through the Social Security Administration uh, for due to incapacity and things of that nature for federal loans, not the state loans. The, the private loans. Uh, but in many instances, when you can't afford to pay your student loans, a chapter 13 will reduce the amount that you have to pay along with the others. It will lead to a discharge and then the all your debt would be paid off at that time, assuming you haven't accumulated a lot during the bankruptcy. And that should put you in a position where you can address your student loans uh, better than you can perhaps right now. And uh, sometimes you need an emergency type of filing. As I said, we could do that in a day. If you've done the creditor uh, education and the debtor, uh, the credit counseling, they call it. They call it creditor counseling and debtor education. Once you've done the creditor counseling, we can file for you and put that automatic stay in there and it stops all the legal proceedings, you know, with court, repossession, foreclosure, what have you. So that's, these are things that we can help you with. Uh, this is just a little discussion of credit scores here. Again, uh, if you're in the 580, 669, and 670, 739 situation, uh, your scores are gonna take a hit. Uh, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm not a, a FICO expert, uh, and the algorithms that determine what your credit scores are change periodically, and without warning for that matter, and not only that, FICO has probably, I think, 10 to 12 different scales they use. Uh, but in general, people who are talking about FICO scores are talking about track eight. And this is probably a track eight uh, explanation of things. Uh, you can come back from a 670. <clears throat> Let's say your credit score might take a 50 to 75 point hit if you file a bankruptcy. But if you just start paying in and keeping track of things. And you you actually have to incur debt in order to raise your credit score. So how do you do that if you file bankruptcy? Well, what you can do, and this is a, a very easy, you can go to a credit union or a bank and get a secured visa or MasterCard. Uh, you put $500 into account and you have a $500 credit line. And as long as you pay it on time, the bank reports it to the credit bureaus as if it's their money, not yours. And so you don't, you pay yourself back every month on time, the report goes in paid as agreed. And if you don't do that, well, then you're not gonna be able to rebuild your credit mm -hmm. score. But there is a means of doing it. So that's, that's very important to know that, you know, bankruptcy by itself is not the end of the world. And then there's uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And sometimes people have been call in and they just, are being harassed by creditors and there's false information on their uh, uh, their reports and they violate certain laws. We can file a Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which is actually a federal district court action. And uh, we can stop them from unfair credit practices and the creditor who has uh, 
breaking the law has to pay your legal fees. You get a thousand dollars and cessation of the uh, bad acts, we get our legal fees paid. So it's, sometimes that's a, a good alternative too. And that's also something that can happen between the time you get involved with bankruptcy and the time you actually file. Sometimes creditors will be harassing you and breaking the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, in which case you have a claim against them. And uh, that's something that you can avail yourself of. Uh, so if you're going to come in, uh, here, here's a list of things that we'd like to see. Uh, some of these things have to be given to the trustee. Some of the things are things that we need. Uh, but these are, uh, this is a partial list of what we need. And it will add to the um, uh, value of any uh, first meeting that we have with you if you have these things with you. As I said, credit reports can be gotten for free either on Credit Karma, Credit Sesame, or you can go to www.annualcreditreport.com and get free copies of all three of your, the major credit bureaus' credit reports. So these are things you can do only once a year, mind you, so you don't want to use that uh, carelessly uh, with regard to annualcreditreport.com. But um, Credit Karma, you can get your credit report almost any time. And uh, you only get one, but usually that's sufficient to give you an idea of where you're at and whether or not it's accurate or not. Unfortunately, the credit bureaus and the credit reports are a function of privately operated databases, and they don't have a lot of federal regulation either. So uh, there's errors in them. There's things that shouldn't be in them, and there's things that should be in them that aren't in them. So we, we want to go over credit reports very carefully and make sure that they're as accurate as possible, because we use the information on them to help prepare your petitions as well. Okay? And it's what you don't do. You shouldn't pay, borrow money with lenders before 90 days, because that'll be considered in contemplation of bankruptcy and may end up being non-dischargeable. And that goes for use of credit cards, too. And the same thing with paying off uh, debts before the end of 90 days or within 90 days of filing or a year if you're paying off those insiders who, again, are relatives and partners and businesses and, uh, rel uh, and other creditors that you're related to. Okay? Um, don't subscribe to debt consolidation or anything like that immediately prior because you're wasting your time and your money. And don't listen to anybody that tells you that bankruptcy is not an option. Uh, we have called various credit uh, consolidators and uh, managers. They say, well, you can't file bankruptcy. It's not true. Bankruptcy is an option depending on certain characteristics of your situation. Uh, you can always file. There are consequences to them. But very often, they're much better than the consequences of using one of these other means of dealing with your debt. Unfortunately, many, and, and, many, many yeah, let, let me jump in. Yeah, let me jump in here real quick, too. You know, one of the things that people think is that bankruptcy is actually the last option. And, and that's absolutely not true. Um, when people are facing financial difficulties, when they're thinking about going through their assets, such as 401ks and things of that nature, we absolutely are the first option to consider because we're able to protect your assets in bankruptcy, many of them, and exempt them. And people will often go through their assets and burn through 401ks. Some of the saddest stories I see are people who use up all of their 401k money trying to, to save themselves when they could have preserved all of that in bankruptcy. And what I tell people is they say, we're the first option. Even if you decide not to file bankruptcy, you should ask us those questions so, so that we can help you pr pick the proper option for you. And I just wanted to make that emphasis because I've had too many clients who, who come to us often late and have really done themselves some damage. Uh, like I said, going through 401ks, or maybe they think that the best thing they should do is transfer assets, which is one of the worst things that you can do, is to pay certain creditors first as well, or transfer assets to their kids. Those are all not good things that can be undone by a bankruptcy trustee and can sometimes cost you your discharge. So like I said, we're, we're, we should be the first option in a lot of cases 
uh, just to at least consult, even if you ultimately decide not to file for bankruptcy. I think those are very now, good points, Brian. And um, not only are we talking about uh, the invasion of 401ks, but IRAs, uh, annuities, and things like that, any qualified plan is usually going to be exempt and you're gonna incur huge tax penalties if you take that money out early and it's really hard money to replace. So bankruptcy will protect those assets and possibly give you the means of not having to do that and saving your retirement rather than to uh, not save your retirement, include all sorts of tax costs and stuff like that. So I think those are very good points. Um, so again, our office uh, allows for no obligation consultation. So if you have any thoughts of filing a bankruptcy, you should definitely give us a call. Now I have some questions here uh, from uh, uh, people viewing uh, our webinar. And uh, the uh, first one is how, how long does a bankruptcy stay on my credit report? Brian, you and I just had a discussion about that. You wanna take that question? Uh, sure, the, the, the real quick answer is this. Everything is on your report that would negatively affect it, so long as it's reported for seven years. And that would include judgments, credit card debt, even collections for medical debt. You know, the major thing that is on your credit report for 10 years is a bankruptcy filing. Now, as I was saying earlier though, a bankruptcy filing, just because it's on your credit report, does not hurt you for the entirety of the time for 10 years. I, as Ed said, we've had people you know, after they file their bankruptcy, a couple years later, they're still able to go purchase cars and things of that nature. It's not that you can't get credit again. Now the question may be, what kind of interest rate are you going to pay? And of course, having bankruptcy on your credit report for those first few years is going to affect the interest rate that you'll qualify for. Uh, but eventually, uh, so long as you continue to make payments afterwards and, are, and you start building a good credit history, you'll be able to work your credit back up again. But uh, the quick answer is nearly everything's seven years. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, can I file for bankruptcy more than one time? I think we addressed this a little bit before, but you can file a chapter seven once every seven years, excuse me, eight years, <laughs> eight years. So, uh, but after you file a chapter seven, if, uh, after a four year lapse, you can file a chapter 13. Uh, I've got a gentleman coming into the office tomorrow who filed a chapter seven less than eight years ago. He's gotten himself into a situation where his car was stolen and due to other lapses, he didn't have insurance. And so he has a $35,000 debt on a car that was stolen and he had no insurance. So he asked me if he can file a chapter seven. The answer unfortunately is no, but he can file a chapter 13. The result will be the same, but he's gonna to have to be involved with the court for a period of years in order to get that resolved. But given his income and his dependents and so forth, he's not gonna be anything paying anything to his unsecured creditors. Okay. Um, what are trustees and what do they do? Um, all right, so a, a trustee is the government's representative in a bankruptcy case. And generally you're gonna see a trustee in a seven uh, or chapter seven case a chapter 13 case, and only occasionally in a chapter 11 case. But the trustee has the responsibility for investigating the affairs of the debtor, and they have other duties. In a chapter seven case, it is the duty of the trustee to locate assets, to recover property that it can, to liquidate those assets and property, uh, to cash, to pay out for the benefit primarily of unsecured creditors. Uh, in chapter seven, it is not the duty of a trustee to pay off secured claims such as mortgages in general. Uh, only if there's available equity to pay to unsecured creditors. So in chapter seven, uh, basically they're to investigate your affairs and liquidate property. And there, there's a couple other duties that they have that most people don't even have to worry about. The liquidation of property is the primary uh, duty that a chapter seven trustee has. In a chapter 13 case though, 
While the trustee has the same duty to investigate the affairs of the debtor and to look into your income and, and other things, uh, the primary duty in a Chapter 13 or for a Chapter 13 trustee is to receive payments from you for disbursements to your creditors because in a Chapter 13 case, the uh, we have a plan for the repayment of creditors. And so uh, the trustee is retained in a case or assigned in a case to take the payments that you make and to disperse those funds to creditors. Of course, the trustee in a Chapter 13, just like a Chapter 7 trustee, they have other obligations to investigate your affairs and uh, they also have a general duty to monitor your case, to object to confirmation of your plan, and to object at other matters. So their duties are substantially different. And in a Chapter 13 case, it's also, it also must be noticed that a Chapter 13 trustee has no control over your property because in a Chapter 13, the debtor retains his property and he just makes payments to the trustee. So that's a big difference. Chapter seven trustee liquidates assets and a chapter 13 trustee disperses funds to creditors. In essence is what the difference is. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, the next question is, how can I remove false negative remarks from my credit report? Well, typically the best way to do that is to dispute the false negatives through the website that I mentioned, um, www.annualcreditreport.com. All the three major bureaus have uh, a process that's online that you can dispute it. And under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, if they don't respond in 60 days, then you can actually go to court and sue them to get it removed and they have to pay your legal fees as well. So um, dispute it first and then avail yourself of the Fair Credit Reporting Act and uh, that, that should fix your, your credit report. Uh, the next question is, will I have to attend court? Well, we addressed this a little bit during the course of the webinar. Uh, typically, you go down for that one meeting with the trustees, we call it a 341 meeting or a creditor's exam. Uh, but after that, it's not typical that you do have to attend court. And again, it's not typical that you appear before a judge either. Later on, if there are other complications with your case, you may have to attend hearing from the judge. But hopefully we can help you avoid those things. Okay, and uh, how would I incur additional legal fees? And how, would I, how soon would I have to pay them? Well, if there are complications with your case, and I, we have our fees online here right now. Uh, if there are complications with your case, there, you may incur additional legal fees. Uh, we don't quote flat fees because everybody's situation is different. Typically, the fees that are posted there for Chapter 7 are sufficient, and we, we sometimes have other fees over and above that uh, if there's issues about unprotected equity and uh, a overzealous trustee trying to get uh, our client's property and things like that. And candidly, it can run up quite a bit of money. But for most cases, that's it, and maybe, uh, maybe a couple hundred dollars or so. You're required to pay those fees. We do have written retainer agreements. But you know you can work them out with us, and we work with our clients to make sure that they can get through this. Uh, it's not our uh, orientation, so to speak, to make the, uh, the solution worse than the than the problem in the first place. And then the last question I have here so far is, what is a secured creditor? A secured creditor is a creditor who has access to your property. For instance, a mortgage lender you've given them the right to foreclose and take away your property if you don't pay them. That's part of the consideration for them lending you all that money. Same thing for a car creditor. They have a, usually a secured interest in that car. And until you pay it off, they have a lien on the car. And if you don't, they can repossess the car. So those are secured creditors. Uh, sometimes people have relationships with their credit unions where, and if they sign a credit union agreement, credit union is often a secure creditor because they have a lien against your share accounts, which is your draft account or your checking account and your savings account. And if you default on them, they can take those things. And they're a, a, a particular problem in bankruptcy because 
the credit unions, unlike the banks, have a provision called the set-off provision. The set-off provision allows them to take that money and not give it back. And so they can set off what you have in your accounts against the debt that you owe them. So not only do they have a secured interest in those things, they can actually take it and you'll never see it again. So that's why you want to be very careful if you're using a credit union to handle your affairs. Any other questions yet, Tim? Okay, so let's see what else we got here. Uh, I think we've done that. Um, we, we, you know, invite people to call us for a no obligation appointment. We're a full service law firm here. The people that you've met tonight here are on my bankruptcy staff. We also have people who do civil litigation, estate planning, tax resolution, business planning. And uh, with the addition of a new associate, we also are doing divorce and domestic relations. So we would welcome any interest that you have by giving us a call and we look forward to hearing from you. Please feel free to call us with any questions that you have uh, tomorrow and uh, we'll be sure to get back to you. Okay, that's it for tonight. Uh, I hope that you found this to be helpful. We've gone over a lot of territory, a lot of information. We might have gone over it a bit too, too quickly for some of you. Uh, if you want to find out more information about a particular subject, again, you're invited to give us a call, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. And uh, I wish you well, and I hope that you stay well as well. So with that, I'll wish you a good evening and good night.